money are involved. It's estimated that at least $10 billion US dollars are generated each year from smuggling migrants. Criminals are making huge profits, and these profits come directly at the cost of the lives of men, women, and children who are exploited, abused, and terribly sometimes also left to die simply because they are pursuing a better life. Uh, this topic has been, I think, catapulted back into public attention by the very recent and very tragic finding of 53 migrants found dead recently in the back of a lorry in Texas, which I think reminds us this really is a global challenge. It's not a challenge of the global south. It's a challenge that, that I think strikes all of us in all of our states and continues to be a challenge. It is clear that more needs to be done to stop this. Uh, the international community, I think, has, has galvanized. We have international conventions. We have significant amounts of money pumped into trying to stop migrant smuggling. We have international institutions doing their best, but still migrant smuggling continues to be a, a scourge uh, for the international community. The FATF specifically is working to help governments tackle the dirty money that is directly linked to migrant smuggling. Uh, they also are working with governments to understand the way that smuggling networks operate and how smuggling networks launder uh, funds. Uh, it published an excellent report earlier this year. Again, I hope you've had the chance to look at it and we will be discussing it. I think two main messages really emerged from that report. One, it points to the way that the modus operandi, the way that smugglers operate, has changed in recent years. And secondly, it really raises attention on the way that the proceeds from smuggling are transferred and laundered and asks to what extent authorities are being successful in dealing with the proceeds of migrant smuggling. So let's, for this seminar, focus on uh, what needs to be done. What can governments, the private sector, and NGOs and civil society do to improve our response to migrant smuggling, and in particular, tackle this issue of the proceeds that are developed and, and generated uh, by the issue. I'm joined, I'm delighted to say, by an expert panel of guests. I'll introduce them now quickly. Uh, the first is Lucia Bird who is director of the West Africa Observatory at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Secondly, we have Salvador Briseno, who is a criminal intelligence officer at the Human Trafficking and Smuggling of Migrants Unit at Interpol. Thirdly, Zana Kalava, who is a German banking risk analyst and who's been heavily involved in German public-private partnerships to tackle financial crime, including migrant smuggling and human trafficking. And finally, a dear friend and colleague indeed from the University of Maastricht, Melissa Siegel, who is head of migration studies and head of the migration and development research section at Maastricht University. I'm delighted that we have such a, a distinguished group of panelists from such a wide range of uh, perspectives. Last point of housekeeping from me before we get into this discussion, it's for the many of you who are joining us online. There is an area at the bottom of your Zoom display where you can post questions to the panelists as they strike you. I can't promise we'll get through all of the questions. We only have an hour for this webinar, but I'll certainly do my best to highlight some of them. And of course, the panelists will be able to look at them as we go through the session uh, and afterwards um, as well. So I think without further ado, let's try to make this informal. We haven't invited our panelists to make long uh, presentations. This is really in the spirit of a fireside chat. We are inviting experts to reflect on their experiences, their expertise, and help bring us up to date and help hopefully inform better responses to this challenge. So let's see if we could start with Salvador Briseno. Salvador, um, you've spent a long time investigating migrant smuggling. Could you perhaps say a few words about how you think migrant smugglers modi operandi, the way that they operate and function, has changed over time? What are the key changes that we're, that we're seeing in the way that smugglers are operating? Well, thank, thank you very much. Considering that I've been investigating migrant smuggling and trafficking organizations for well over 30 years, I have seen the kind of the evolution of the way they have worked. Uh, my area of expertise, I, I, I have been able, I've worked hundreds of investigations, uh, but my area of expertise has been the Americas and the Caribbean. So I'll speak specifically to that region of the world and the way that I've seen social media um, being incorporated in migrant smuggling and even trafficking organizations. What I've seen is that there will be sometimes some smuggling organizations, they will purport themselves to be um, travel agencies. And they will suggest to, to the customer base out abroad saying, look, if you want to go from this country to this country, and if you don't have a visa, don't worry, we'll take care of it. 
Other others will be pretty blatant and they will say, if you don't have a visa, don't worry, we're going to get you from one country to another. We're going to smuggle you. And they actually will use the word smuggle. Uh, other other circumstances that I've seen, like uh, Facebook postings, I've seen where the um, individuals will go ahead and say, look, we will help you to move from one country to another. And we know that it's in the and in an illegal manner. Don't worry about it here. Go ahead and direct message me offline. And they, they either ask for for communication through uh, Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp or otherwise. But the main the main point is that they want to go ahead and grab that customer and then go ahead and pull them in. Uh, lastly, one thing that is pretty brazen is I've actually seen some individuals that are offering their smuggling services and they will actually post a video, let's say on YouTube or otherwise, and they will show a vehicle and they'll say, look, you're gonna be moved in this in this type of vehicle. It has air conditioning. You don't have to worry about crossing a desert or through, through any other uh, uh, jungle area. You'll be conveniently transferred from one place to another. And, and look, we even have some customers here and sometimes, and they've actually even had some of the coat and coat customers that they were customers give some testimonials on their treatment, how well they were treated and, and how the company, the actual smugglers moved them from one location to another. Although you, you, as you say, focusing on a particular region of the world, you describe a fairly sophisticated model where smugglers are pretty brazenly using social media in a corporate sort of fashion to attract customers, to mislead customers and to, to move customers uh, as they're termed across the world. I was very interested, you spoke just now about the way that smugglers openly use the term smuggling. They openly use the term illegal. Is there no stigma any longer attached for migrants to move illegally? Is this no longer an issue for people, you don't think? You know, one thing One thing that I've, that I've noticed, um, because I, I have worked uh, narcotic smuggling investigations as well. And w whenever we were do, say, uh, wiretaps, uh, listening in on the telephones, many times within smugg uh, narcotic smuggling organizations, they would use different terms to, to represent different types of drugs, like code words. But when, when I've been involved in some of these uh, migrant smuggling investigations on some wiretaps, they really, uh, I hadn't really seen much much uh, uh, code words being used in migrant smuggling migrant smuggling cases versus say narcotic cases maybe maybe they believe that that they're that they're not susceptible to really having say wiretaps being conducted or more more uh, extensive investigations are uh, being conducted against them and they see it as a less of a crime than say moving drugs Oh, I do. I want to bring Melissa in if I could, and I'm just keeping an eye on the participants. We have 954 participants already for this webinar. And as a reminder, colleagues, if you want to share your experience, please do enter uh, questions into the chat box. Melissa, let me turn to you. I know you have a deep experience in migration generally and this area of migrant smuggling. How, how have you seen changes in, in the way that, that smugglers are operating? Yeah, thanks for that. So, um, I mean, I think, uh, as Salvador mentioned, a lot of his experiences in the Americas, a lot more of my experiences in, let's say, Europe, Africa, South Asia situation. And we definitely see some of those same trends. So, you know, the increasing use of social media and different kind of technologies. Um, but, but also, like was mentioned before, for maybe with travel agencies, something else I have regularly seen is also people posing as kind of work recruiters, um, posing as legitimate business, you know, um, saying they'll also take care of visas and everything. And sometimes people then thinking that they're actually migrating in a more regular legalized way when they're actually not. So um, we do see this where, uh, of course, in some cases, they know that they're also being moved in, an, in any regular way. But some other things that I've also seen is, you know, with social media, social media has really started to play a much bigger role, both for the smugglers themselves, but also for the, the migrants who would like to move between countries. And what we've seen also is that sometimes they get information overload and that they are no longer even aware of who to trust or which information is correct because they're finding conflicting information online. And then they're again turning back to their kind of, you know, friends, family members, those those kind of original sources of information to try to sift through all of the information. And that doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be correct, but we are seeing this kind of information overload and then, okay, how do I deal with that information overload? And, and um, 
another thing is that even though we've seen this kind of increased sophistication, um, you know, with new technologies and things like that, we also still see lots of low level quote unquote smugglers that are just other migrants themselves that are working for, let's say the bigger organizations, either recruiting people or helping people along, or maybe being the person who drives the boat. So a lot of very low level people who are really just kind of working within the network to finance their own onward journey. So we still see quite, quite a range of, uh, of different ways that people are being involved in this area. Thanks, thanks, Melissa. And I think that's an important point about the spectrum that we're speaking about. It's not just large transnational organized crime. It's also often what used to be called mom and pop outfits doing small scale smuggling across local borders. And as you say, a network of different people involved in this in this process. I want to come back a little bit later to the point of information and information overload and how uh, the international community and governments and the private sector, I'm thinking of social media companies, can begin to address that, that challenge. One of the questions, perhaps for you, Melissa, that's come up from a colleague and Sumana Cham, could the experts provide some of the pull factors in migrant smuggling and trafficking? I haven't worked in this field for a while, Melissa, but certainly when I worked in it, we were aware that there were push factors. People wanted to leave their country because of poverty or conflict or persecution. But equally, we were aware that there were pull factors. People would move into countries where they felt they could find a job or a better future. Could you say a little bit about, about your experience about the pull factors for, for migrant smuggling? Sure, yeah. I mean, of course, people are generally looking for a better life, and that could be for a number of reasons. And people might, you know, want to go to specific countries because they already have networks or family members there. That is very common, you know, but also the, the idea that maybe it's easier to integrate there or get a job or there's, you know, all of these different things are really pull factors. Also, just thinking about access to services or the quality of life that people can have. Um, if we take a very kind of forced migration situation where you, you have refugees who've been living in camps, you know, for years, maybe in Jordan or Lebanon or Kenya or wherever, um, you know, many of these people don't have access to quality services for their family members, for their children. And they're really looking for places where they know that they can get decent access to services. So there are a number of pull, quote unquote, pull factors that we also see here that's also making people want to make the migration in the first place. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, again, just, Harvey, if, 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 please, if I may, one, one, one real quick point. One, one other thing uh, to, to kind of supplement what Melissa went ahead and noted. One thing that we've seen also is that in order to, to make it more comfortable for some of the potential migrants to end up engaging with some of these migrant smuggling organizations, we will see females, female recruiters that will go to certain locations in different countries uh, where, where, where migrants are congregating in order for them to approach women to offer them the services of smugglers and, and make they, they make the women feel a lot more comfortable that, oh, I'm dealing with a woman here. Uh, and, and they think that that sometimes they may be dealing along the route with that same woman or with other women, when in fact they have no idea who mm -hmm. they're going to be passed on to. It may be other organizations. They don't know what uh, safe house drop houses are going to be dropped off at. They don't know in what kind of conditions they're going to be moved from one location to another in a tractor in the back of a tractor trailer in uh, hidden in in, uh, in in other compartments or otherwise. But um, and and just as just as well as how they are encountered by some of these women, a woman to woman to have that comfort. Uh, also, some of these social media postings, they will sometimes have some of these recruiters be women that are reaching out to people. Maybe if I can just follow up with that too. Um, so you know, one thing that we have also found quite a bit in our own research is, for example, the information that migrants have when they're being smuggled about the journey, about what's going to happen along the way, about the risks is often very different in different quote unquote corridors. So for example, people that are um, being smuggled from Eritrea, for example, or from more East African countries, we found that they often have a lot more information about the dangers of the journey compared to people um, coming through West Africa. And for example, we've seen that sometimes women even leaving um, Eritrea already are taking huge amounts of birth control because of the risks of sexual violence um, along the way, when we're not seeing that as common for women who are coming um, from West African routes. So there are really big differences also in people's access to information or their real knowledge about what's gonna happen along the journey. 
And I think your comment there and Salvador's comment sort of really highlight the question in the chat box from Igor Ivanov, which is what are the prevention measures? It's hard to prevent this given its complexity, given the transnational networks, given the role of social media. And let's perhaps come back to that. A really interesting question from William Barry. Has social media also changed the way individuals pay for these services? I think that's an interesting question. And Mamoun Mahmoud also points out that surely there's a role for the big four audit firms to become involved much more directly in this. And we'll come to that perhaps a little bit later. Let me come to another question on, on my script that I think is, is, is important for us. And that, of course, we, we, we hope one day not to have to discuss the COVID-19 pandemic, but I'm afraid we're still there. Uh, Lucia, uh, in your experience, how has COVID-19, the pandemic, the responses to the pandemic, we know that it's generated inequalities around the world and so on, how has it impacted smuggling networks? And how in particular do you think it's impacted the way that they launder their proceeds? Well, as we know, COVID led to the temporary closure of official border entry points and the almost complete stopping of air traffic, um, passenger air traffic for a while, and the closure of many legal migration pathways. So, and again, the impacts differentiated between regions and between routes, but across a number of routes, we did see a temporary lull in, in movement. Um, but it did drive a greater proportion of those that continued wanting to move into irregularity because there were no regular options. In, in tandem to this, we saw accelerating a trend that we've already been seeing, increased border control, increased securitization of borders, and also increased economic strain, which is exacerbating economic stresses, which is one of the big drivers of migration. So cumulatively um, in the pandemic, we saw in a lot of areas demand for smugglers rise um, among those on the move because it became much harder to move independently. This alongside the increased risk because of the increased focus of on interception by authorities means that across a number of routes, we saw a spike in prices over COVID. Um, and for example, in a survey done with migrants and refugees on the move across the world in September 2020 by the Mixed Migration Center, over half of migrants and refugees reported a substantial increase in price since the beginning of the pandemic. And the second really important impact here is on the protection risks that are faced by those on the move because we see smugglers taking riskier routes to avoid detection. Um, and also in some areas, we saw increases in maritime routes, which are the most deadly of irregular migration routes because land and air routes became much more difficult. And I'd like to use one, one route in particular as a case study, which we've been tracking really quite closely, um, which is the Atlantic route. So the maritime route from um, the coast of West Africa, predominantly Senegal and Mauritania, as well as Morocco, to the Canary Islands of Spain. And the vast majority of those arriving cited economic reasons as the key driver um, for having embarked on the journey. And a lot cited the collapse of the hospitality industry, of tourism, the economic strains of lockdown, as those straws that really pushed them over the edge. Um, and also the fact that other routes had become much more dangerous, both because of COVID border closures and because of exacerbated border control measures. And just to throw out a statistic which really does show the magnitude of, of impact, and it's not all because of COVID, there are a number of factors, but COVID definitely played into this. In 2019, there were roughly 2,700 migrants and refugees arriving in the Canaries by sea. In 2020, this rose to around 23,000. And the same volume has been sustained in 2021. And as far in the first year, half of this year, um, we're, we're still seeing those rates. And the Atlantic route is the most dangerous smuggling route in the world. So it really encapsulates what we're seeing of this growth of movement in some irregular migration routes, many of them very, very dangerous, and growth in the protection risks that migrants are, are facing. And yes. the final Sorry, point, as I know I've, I've gone on on this point, but I think it really brings into relief this uh, relationship between the kind of predominant responses that we're seeing in terms of securitization and border control and shrinking legal pathways and protection risks for migrants. And that really does underscore the urgency of exploring other response frameworks, including around financial flows, which we're discussing here today and which the FATF report, of course, focuses on in a moment onto those financial flows. But I think a really interesting question here from Andrew Dalip to you. 
uh, he says, have you seen a correlation between the increase in pricing for smuggling during the pandemic and therefore an increase in smuggling clients ultimately being trafficked? Uh, now, for our thousand or so participants, uh, many of you will know there is a at least legal a distinction between smuggling and trafficking, or often they, they do blur into one another. Smuggling being largely a voluntary movement where you pay for a service, trafficking being an involuntary movement where you are forced against your will to move. Andrew is asking whether the increasing prices for smuggling may be forcing some people into the trafficking route. Do you have any any thoughts on that, Lucia? Yes, it's it's difficult to to talk generally across all routes um, in the world, but but something that we have seen across a number of routes, and which also makes sense in line with the economic stresses, is that in some routes we are seeing increases in the travel now pay later payment structures. Now, what that means is that um, migrants and refugees typically don't have enough funds to, to pay for the journey before they travel. And so they enter into debt with the smuggler on the understanding that they will work along the route in order to repay that debt. Now, this payment modality exposes those on the moves to a huge risk of trafficking because the type of work that is being done along the journey is typically in exploitative conditions that would fall within the definition of trafficking. So although it's hard to, to track um, those increased risks across lots of different routes, we are seeing some of these types of increased risks and particularly we can track these through shifts in payment modalities which shape the vulnerabilities of those on the move. Thanks Lucia. It may be um it may depressingly be premature to talk about the end of the pandemic. Certainly in certain parts of the world it, it remains a serious challenge and I think a, an enduring challenge. But is there any sign from your research that um I mean, migrant smuggling is normalizing, prices are reducing, perhaps the patterns that we used to have are, are re-emerging, or do you think COVID has changed things for, for, for good? Again, it, it depends on routes. For example, on, on some of the prices that, that we saw to move from, from Mali into Algeria, we saw a very temporary spike when, when that border really was quite closed, but also importantly, because the border closures led to further difficulties in fuel smuggling between the two countries, which increased the price of fuel, which then increased the price of smuggling. But we saw those prices come back to the pre-pandemic norms um, as the security on the Algeria border eased. So, you know, within eight months, more or less, of the start of the pandemic, we saw a return um, to pre-pandemic prices. So it really depends. The prices are really set to a significant extent by the degree of risk and the degree of demand. So it, we tend to see that in, in areas where the degree of border control, the degree of focus on intercepting smugglers has remained higher than pre the pandemic, prices also remain more elevated. While in other areas where those controls have eased, we have seen prices return to pre-pandemic levels. However, just to go back to that example I cited of the Atlantic route um, to the Canaries, we are still seeing movement that is more, ten, more than 10 times um, what we were seeing pre-pandemic now in 2022. And as I said, COVID, the pandemic is, is not the only reason, but it does show long lasting impacts of many of the changes associated with the response to, to the pandemic. Very much, Lucia. And again, lots of very interesting questions coming through on the chat, and I'll try to keep an eye on them. Let's move now to the question of the the money. And I think here we'll bring in Salvador and I hope Zana as well in particular. Uh, and and we heard at the beginning of my brief introduction, Salvador. Let's start with you. Uh, an estimate that something like ten billion dollars a year are generated from this crime of of migrant smuggling. How important is it to try to deal with these illicit profits, and how well are we doing as an international community to to do that? Well, certainly. The reason that migrant smugglers get involved in the in this type of activity is for the money. Um, <clears throat> one, one of the things one of the things that kind of caught my caught my attention twenty some odd years ago was when a smuggler that I had arrested <clears throat> had mentioned. He said, "Oh, so how long am I going to prison for? Three years? Oh, not a problem. I can do it standing on my head." Um, <clears throat> he said, "As soon as I come back, as soon as I come back out of out of prison, I'm going to have my money. I'm going to have my property and everything else. And uh, so, therefore, the asset forfeiture asset forfeiture laws uh, within different countries is really the way to tackle tackle this epidemic of of taking away the goods, taking away that the money, the property, the things that that the smugglers value. And that's really where." There, there's a term called follow the money. And that really is kind of the focus that that country should be uh, looking at. 
Um, Lucia's got a hand up. Let me just go to Zana first, Lucia, before you. Zana, you're a, a risk analyst in a, in, a, in a banking system. What's your perspective on this on this challenge of illicit profits and how we can how we can get on top of it? So, so def definitely, the challenge I can say from uh, from private sector, uh, definitely, the, the, it is the challenge that uh, we cannot always say that we can follow the money. But uh, for example, when we are, I'm talking with my colleagues in, in private sector and we are discussing about the topic, I can often say, yes, it's a serious crime, but uh, the migrant smuggling are using uh, uh, excessive use of cash on unofficial banking methods such as Kavala and avoiding well-regulated banks. That is true. Yes, of course, that is true. But at the end, they are using well-regulated banks. And in this role, we as a bank, as a private sector can react because there are definitely risk indicators that can help us in our transaction to somehow to follow the money. In a case that we are having transaction, where we are having, for example, reoccurring transaction with money remittance companies, online payments, or something that without logical reason, we can say, okay, there are indicators. When you are having transaction with money mules, that are also can be indicators. In retail banking, we can have migrants or foragers that are using the same IP or machine uh, ID to perform transaction or transaction in connection with the gambling or in gambling industry. All those indicators can be potential red flags, or we as an investigator, we are calling this the red flags that could guide us to do more and more extensive investigation at the end, like a targeted investigation, deep dive investigation or look backs, and the end to have input that we can at the end provide this to the relevant authorities and then they have can have actually the triggers to have a migrant smuggling investigation on the ground. And I think that is the most important, the cooperation between public and also private uh, sector to exchange those information. Thank you. And Zana, I just want to thank you in particular for being here, because I think public-private partnerships around this topic are so important and often so hard to establish. So it's great that someone with your experience and expertise is joining us. Lucia has her hand up and Salvador. This is great. This is in the spirit of having an open discussion. Before I invite you both, let me just read a couple of questions from the chat that I think are, are pretty relevant. Paul de Garabedian, can the panelists provide any insight on how individuals within the smuggling organization collect and move funds? e.g. are there third party facilitators or financial service providers? And then a question from Enobong Essien directly for Salvador. How do you detect monies laundered for migrant smuggling? Is there a pattern to such monies? Let's start with Lucia as her hand up went up first, then Salvador, please. Lucia, please. Thank you. Um, I think Zana really clearly set out the advantages of having um, payments for, for smuggling services moving through formal financial systems um, and also highlighted that a huge proportion moves outside of formal financial systems through, for example, Hawalada structures, um, which part, partly in line with the, the question, do use trusted intermediaries to move funds between different jurisdictions without ever actually touching the formal financial system. And I think this really underscores the importance of financial inclusion, of bringing more of those financial transfers into the formal system, out of this shadow banking system that has developed not only for payments for migrant smuggling, but also for a huge proportion of remittance payments, which are in themselves a huge volume of international um, financial flows. And of course, when payments are moving in the shadow banking system, they cannot be tracked. Um, so how, how, do we, how do we do this? Well, as the FATF report highlighted, often Hawaladar transfers carry a relatively significant charge, 13%, 15% in some areas. And migrants and refugees are looking to move money safely and cheaply and quickly. And if formal financial services can essentially undercut the informal market on those characteristics, we can try and tempt more of those payments into the formal sector and then bring them under the type of oversight than, that Zana highlighted. And this also has a, a secondary benefit. So firstly, we can use follow the money approaches to 
hone in on these kind of larger criminal organizations um, that are really making quite large profits um, out of the smuggling industry. But also, as I noted earlier, payment modalities can have huge implications for the safety of those on the move. And I think what's become very clear is it is not possible to stop global irregular migration. So a key goal needs to be to make it safer. And payment modalities can play a really important role there if formal financial structures can encourage structures where payment is held until the safe arrival of the migrant, a role currently usually done by a trusted third party in formal Hawalada, then that could again safeguard the rights of those that are on the move. So really kind of bringing financial inclusion into the center of debate, um, you know, it really enhances the ability of the private sector and of states to track money, to take action, but it can also have huge ramifications for the safety of those that are moving. Lucia and Andrew Dallip again I think largely agrees with you uh, asking whether it's smugglers dictating the fact that we often use hawala and, and informal flows or whether it's the fact that many people who are being smuggled are indeed financially excluded and have no other uh, alternative. And, and partly through de-risking uh, yes. regulations and ha having those impacts. Thanks. Salvador please you had a Point. Yes. Yeah, a, a couple of points. I want to go ahead and reinforce what Lucia had mentioned earlier during about the COVID times. One thing that we had seen when COVID hit was there was kind of a little bit of a pause um, during when COVID came around for everybody really to kind of assess what was going on. But then like Lucia went ahead and mentioned, the flows not only continued, but they increased. That's what we saw, especially within the Latin America region. Uh, or I should say the Americas and Caribbean region. Um, that was one thing. The other thing, when uh, as far as as far as the movement of money, I recall I recall arresting people and making seizures where vehicles had all their cavities and uh, the, under the seats and everything else filled with cash. Or we would have appliances uh, that were being taken out from the United States to to another country filled with cash. The smugglers, they would they accumulate so much cash, they need a way to get rid of it. Now, one thing that they are employing is they're using some of these small little money cards that that uh, I, I live in France, so I'm, I'm not sure the quantity of, of uh, how much you can actually put on one of these little cards, like the MasterCards or Visa cards or, or otherwise. But the monies, the little cards where they can charge X quantity of money on the, on the cards and then some of these individuals, they will leave the United States and they will have boxes and boxes of these, I should say thousands of these cards. Uh, and if a customs inspector, as, as they're entering another country, sees one of these cards, how are they to know how much money is on each individual card? That's one way that they, that they are employing to, to move the money. Somebody asked uh, the question about how is it that, that we are able to identify uh, smuggling funds that are used for in, in, in the laundering of, of proceeds? Really, an investigation has to start somewhere. Uh, so whether, whether we have somebody being arrested and, and they are able to, we kind of backtrack, how is it that, that this person, say, is a, is a smuggled migrant? Who is it that they contacted? And then we try to find out who the smuggling organization is. That's way, one way to see about uh, looking at the organization. Another way is uh, we sometimes have anonymous phone calls that, are, that come in talking about individuals that are potentially smuggling. And if you, if you boil it down to, to just kind of some of the basics, it's money in, money out. Whenever we're looking at someone, a, 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 an individual, at an entity, we're going to check, say, say a business. If, if a business is being used for laundering money, how much money is it that they are showing that's coming in as revenue per month and how much money may be going out? How, how, uh, what type of lifestyle is it that it appears that these individuals have? Are they living outside of their means? So th these are some of the ways that we employ investigative wise to pursue that. Harris. Can I add on? And I can Sorry, please, this. Please, actually, the, the, the practical part that uh, Salvador explained is also the part that we are doing in, in this industry. Once we are having our indicators and recognize this intersection, then we are doing the same thing to see if that is uh, something that is uh, normal with the customer background and if uh, that is a normal lifestyle. So all those in indicators itself actually are not a warrant 
that we are really having suspicious of migrant smuggling, but it could be potential and at the end uh, could lead to some valuable input that at the end we will uh, give to the uh, relevant uh, stakeholders and regulatory. On and helping helping to illuminate how the private sector can help to, to identify and detect these illegal proceeds. Um, I guess this is one more for Salvador before moving on. I had a question for Melissa. Bobby Harris in the chat. Besides stringent laws against smuggling and trafficking, divesting criminals of the illicit proceeds, asset forfeiture, is a more effective means of dissuading perpetrators of the crime. Is Bobby right, Salvador? Yes, they're absolutely right, because why is it that these individuals are, are involved in this? Uh, separating separating those one individuals that that say a family member is trying to smuggle another family member a husband is trying to smuggle the wife or vice versa all these other individuals that may be part of an organization why are they doing all this as it for over the 30 30 plus years that i've been investigating this crime it's really it comes down to the money it comes down to the money so i mean taking away the money that that's going to be the big deterrent uh yes putting somebody in jail uh is a deterrent but but really, like that one individual mentioned over 20 years ago, I can do the time in prison standing on my head because he knows that he's going to have his money when he comes out. Philomi Govenda, very interesting comment from Zana. I'm also with a private banking background in South Africa. I think it's a pity some banks do not employ skilled individuals, individuals who do not have the experience or expertise to see the red flags. Zana, is that... It, do you agree? Are you a rare? Are you a rarity in the in the private banking world? Or are there more people like you doing the sorts of work that you're doing? Um, I can I cannot agree or disagree in this way. I think the most important thing actually that to be aware that this awareness and the end that we need to train people how to recognize this to say it is not a crime that is happening somewhere. It's happening here and it's happening now. So that is the most important thing that this message should be all around the banks, not only in uh, financial crimes. So, uh, and also what I would really say, the target investigation should be done or even dedicated units, they are doing this. Because to be honest, just to work with a transaction monitoring system, we will not be able to see such a, a payments, I would say, or to recognize, or even when with a, with, that would be coincidence as such. Thanks, Anna. And I guess another one for you from... William Barry, again, speaking of payment modalities, has anyone noticed an increased use of virtual currency? I think that's an interesting question, presumably hard to track. Any, any evidence on that? I would say we are seeing trends um, using or misusing virtual currency, but at this point we cannot say that that is definitely something that is in connection with migrant smuggling. We can say that there are indicators there, but um, I can at this stage not say that it's true. So I, I just want to bring in Melissa with a, with a topic that's on yeah. my mind a little, which is about money going the other direction, remittances. Melissa, any evidence that people who are smuggled send back remittances, that those remittances might be then pumped into generating more smuggling? Is there a sort of cycle that, that develops around this in, in your research? Oh, well, that's a good question. I mean, people send back, you know, money for a number of reasons. So a major reason in general why a migrant goes abroad or why families send migrants abroad is for a better life, but also the hope that that person is going to be able to work and earn money abroad and send some, at least some of that money back. And it is true that some of that money could be used to finance further migration through smuggling routes. I would not say that this is the main reason for my for remittance sending, but of course it is one of the things that remittances can be used for. The mic, Melissa, any other comments on this topic, on the, on the money, following the money? Sorry, I think I just missed part of what you said. Could you just, just ask, since you have the mic, do you have any other oh. thoughts on this idea of following the money and, and the money flows through this process? Well, yeah, yes. I mean, as Salvador has also mentioned earlier, money is a big reason why people are doing this. And we also have to be, I mean, I, you know, quite, I think, realistic about how money flows are going and who's also profiting from these things. And um, yes, there are criminal organizations. And many times also, I would say, even within high levels of government and government officials, at least in my experience, in the countries of origin often, or sometimes transit where, where the migrants are coming from, they are also major players. And one of the reasons why we don't see a big crackdown sometimes in those countries is because senior officials are also involved. And uh, I have 
I have witnessed situations where, um, you know, even for example, border guards that I have trained have detained people knowing that they were smuggling people or trafficking people. And those same, um, let's say smugglers saying, look, I'll just give you $2,000 right now to let me out because I'm going to be out in 24 hours anyway, you know, and, and that actually happening. So the person being detained, the, the border guard getting a call within 24 hours from a senior, uh, a boss saying, let this person out, this person then flew on. And, um, and here's where cooperation also comes into play, because I know that this person, the person was flying to Germany, and my former student actually called the German border police and said, this person is coming. I'm quite sure that they are smuggling. Um, please have a look at them. And so the person was then detained in Germany and actually prosecuted. So, you know, even when there are sometimes difficulties um, in one national context, smuggling by definition is, you know, going across different, uh, different country borders. And here, I think really, working together is extremely important. I think that's something that also came out of the FATF report. Thanks, thanks. Melissa Salvador, please. Uh, to, to, to add on what Melissa went ahead and noted, with, within the Americas and Caribbean region where, where I have been working, there are, there are some outstanding, outstanding officers uh, with, with very high ethics that, that, that I have come across, that I have worked with, who have been uh, uh, actually offered suitcases, loads of money and they have, they have uh, uh, not accepted it. However, the unfortunate part is, just like Melissa went ahead and noted, there are, have been individuals in, in different countries that I am aware of through investigations that I have conducted, through investigations where I have been working in, a, in an undercover capacity, where yes, there are some pretty high level individuals within the, the government structure that have been receiving uh, the, those bribes, bribe amounts or or other other individuals that have been in say mid-level positions of authority and they have they have stated during uh, uh points of confidence of conversations that yes uh so much money is going to be going to so and so you know somebody of a of a higher level within their organizations so you kind of have it kind of have it both ways there but uh and, and and certainly is a challenge it's a challenge not only not only for 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 the law enforcement community and, and the private sector trying to work together, but it's also a challenge for the honest officers, those honest officers that are working within an organization that has the corruption kind of built into it, and and they're fighting against that that larger corrupt force, and and that's kind of I, I kind of feel sorry for them. Thanks, Elvador. You're, you're, you're a great panel, and I'm sure that our over 1,100 participants on this webinar are deeply appreciating your experience and expertise, all of you. We have about 20 minutes to go. Um, I will leave a bit of time at the end in case there are any specific questions from the floor, but I'm also trying to go through them as you put your questions into the chat box, so please carry on doing that. I think there's, I mean, various other questions we could go over, but many of you have begun to touch upon them. There is one here that I have a particular interest in that was put before me that I'd like to start with Lucia on. And this is the, I mean, very interesting, very sensitive question about the linkages between migrant smuggling and terrorist financing. There is some evidence in the FATF report that some of the, 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 the financing generated from smuggling may be used for terrorism. What's, what's our experience on that, Lucia? Um, the short answer is to a degree in some contexts. Um, I'm gonna focus my response on, on Africa and specifically on the, the Sahel, Mali and Libya, which were two examples highlighted in the FATF report as areas where this uh, risk of profits from, from migrant smuggling um, flowing into uh, jihadist or terrorist operations was particularly acute. Um, and really the, the main way that we see profits from the smuggling industry flowing to jihadist actors is in areas where jihadist groups are exercising a degree of territorial control and therefore they are taxing the movement of commodities and people, be that licit or illicit, through that area. Um, and so if we kind of hone in on, on Northern Mali, um, where uh, the coordination des mouvements de l'Azawad, um, as well as Jainim, which is a jihadist group, um, exercise a significant degree of territorial control and the delineations between those two different groups are very, very blurred. 
Um, and here we, we are aware that drivers um, transporting people um, through through Northern Mali, and they're known to make protect, protection payments um, to elements of the armed groups that control the territory. Um, and while some of the actors involved in the transportation of migrants here are affiliated with the armed groups, there's little indication that armed groups view migrant smuggling as a key source of revenue for their operations. Instead, it's, it's more characterized as an activity that takes place in their territories, which then becomes a revenue stream as a matter of course. And I think it's worth highlighting that there are other illicit economies, um, many of which have received less focus with clearer links to terrorist or jihadist financing in these areas. Um, for example, uh, artisanal gold mining, the kidnapping industry, the cattle rustling industry. Um, in Mali, all of those, um, we believe, are a greater source of revenue for jihadist groups. Um, and it's important to recognize this because in some areas, there's little justification for prioritizing addressing smuggling of migrants and peacekeeping mandates over and above other crime types which through a range of different ways, be that through financing or through their impacts on instability, are much more directly linked to the operations of jihadist groups. And then just to, to take the example of, of Libya that was highlighted in the FATF report, um, where of course there, there have been a number of, of jihadist groups operating um, in different areas of the country since 2011. Um, and, and one very specific example, which is in, in 2015, ISIS, took control of a town called Sirte, um, and they started taxing licit and illicit economies, um, and that included migrant smuggling. But ISIS took a pretty heavy-handed approach to taxation, and there were a number of incidents um, that really sent shockwaves um, through human smuggling economies there. In particular, the murder um, by ISIS of a number of migrants um, that were being smuggled through the town. ISIS kidnapped these, the smugglers offered ransom payments to try and get the migrants back alive. ISIS refused, based largely on the um, Christian religion of the migrants, and murdered a number of these. And this really sent shockwaves through um, the communities of the migrants and the smugglers. And what happened? The smuggling routes displaced. So they took alternative smuggling routes that avoided Sirte, that avoided the impacts of ISIS. Um, and this is just one example where, you know, the fact that jihadist groups and criminal networks are operating in the same space does not necessarily mean that there's alliances between the two, that there's financial flows between the two. Um, and at the moment, um, we are not aware of um, evidence to suggest that migrant smuggling is really a very important source of revenue for jihadist groups in, in Libya. And I think that's an important calibrated careful response to what otherwise I think can be quite an incendiary connection that's often made, particularly in the media. Do other colleagues have any reflections on this overlap between migrant smuggling and the funds it generates and other forms of, of crime or illegality? The, the 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 only thing the only thing I would add is that the use the use of uh, counterfeit or alter documents um, is, is really used by different many different criminal networks in order to move from one country to another. We have about 10 minutes to go and I do want to invite the panelists to make some final comments on really from their perspectives what needs to be done next to, to confront this challenge. This is the opportunity for people from the from the audience to, to pose specific questions for specific panelists so if anyone has any please do put them into the chat box and I'll try to address them and as I look at these what do we have here? Some Viana Sharma, this is for Lucia directly. Does Ms. Bird think that more aggressive training is required for law enforcement to investigate terrorism financing and taxation on smugglers? I'm not sure what you make of that, Lucia. Um, I think in general, our, our research across a, a range of different jurisdictions highlights that often the capacities of financial investigation units generally are very low and that therefore follow the money approaches um, when utilized across a range of illicit economies, including human smuggling, but also, for example, the drugs economy, um, are, are limited by, by the lack of training, the lack of capacity, the, la of, the lack of manpower to look at these um, illicit financial flows. So strengthening um, financial investigation units and these financial skill sets among law enforcement um, operations across a range of jurisdictions is definitely a priority. However, as I highlighted, 
Um, in many areas, the, the connection between human smuggling and terrorist financing is, is not clear. In some areas, it's clear the connection is tenuous. Other illicit economies perhaps provide more of a funding stream. So the, the training shouldn't just be narrowed to, to human smuggling payments, um, but overall to financial tracking, illicit financial flows, and how to track illicit proceeds moving through formal financial systems, including to jihadist actors. Thank you, Lucia. Sean Rodriguez, are shell companies being used to hold, move and hide funds? What jurisdictions are trending now for fund transfers? Interesting questions. Does anyone have any insights, any answers, any thoughts? Perhaps Salvador, Zana, Lucia, you seem to be gone, please. Um, well, first, I'd just like to highlight that I, I believe um, that it was relatively recently um, that the, that was it the Jersey um, was was put on on the grey list. So I think the the importance of of some um, I guess financial safe havens in 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 Europe in in the West are really being underscored. And we we definitely do see shell companies um, in a range of, of jurisdictions being used to to launder funds. Just to give one very specific example, in an investigation into a very significant cocaine trafficker. Um, operating in Guinea-Bissau in, in West Africa, there were three shell companies incorporated um, through which funds were moved between Europe, uh, Latin America, as well as West African countries and between different members of the network as well. Yeah, Here's one that I'm going to target on Melissa, just because she's an old friend. And this is almost an ethical question, I think, from Zakaria Al-Shmali. What should migrants do when there are no legal routes nor official financial institutions to use? Yeah, this is a very good question. And I think in a way, it's the elephant in the room, to be honest, because, you know, personally, and I think most of the research shows the best way to fight against smuggling is to take the demand away, right? Um, so let's really get to the root of the issue. Um, if there were more, you know, legal, regular channels for migrants to be able to move on, there would be no demand for migrant smugglers. Um, and I think, you know, there need to be real realistic alternatives to irregular migration if we are serious about tackling this, right? I think now we're looking at treating this a symptom of a problem instead of actually tackling the problem itself. Um, and so I think that's really where we need to be thinking about this. I mean, we know that even besides corruption and all the other things that we've discussed, Cooperation with many origin countries and transit countries is often very difficult for countries of destination. And one of the reasons for this is because even by country, by governments of countries of origin, it's almost seen, it's often even seen as illegitimate for countries of destination to make it so difficult for their um, citizens to be able to go to those countries. So what we should really be looking at here is more realistic, legal, regular alternatives for migration. Um, and, you know, bringing uh, labor supply and labor demand, demand together better is really important here. So migration policy making is one of the, the few or main areas around the world where evidence and policy making don't match very well. Um, which is really, really unfortunate. Um, so we need to see better policy making uh, being made around labor migration, for example, and then more realistic policy making being done around forced migration. So we have seen now, for example, with the war in Ukraine, that it is absolutely possible to absorb and to have well managed um, large numbers of people fleeing a country into other countries um, with what has happened now within Europe and the triggering of the temporary tr protection directive. So we have a good um, case study here for how, you know, we can absorb, integrate, and help large numbers of forced migrants to, which I hope we're going to be taking into the future. Melissa, we still have a thousand or so participants with us. We have five <laughs> minutes to go. I'm going to take one more question from the floor. This one's for Zana. And then I'll invite each of the panelists just to perhaps summarize their key takeaways from what I think has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. It's a shame we don't have two hours to do this rather than just one hour. I, all, the, the label says United Kingdom hyphen Wired. So I'm not sure who this gentleman or lady is, but the question is excellent and it's to Zana. 
What is the most useful information that you provide to law enforcement to investigate migrant smuggling and back the other way? What is the most useful information law enforcement or other authorities give to you to detect migrant smuggling and support intervention? So Zana, really a question about how you can exchange information from a bank uh, with authorities to try to tackle this challenge. Sure. I mean, definitely um, when we are investigating and we are seeing some indicators from the red flags, we are delivering always the transactions that are included and we are uh, describing why we are thinking that might be potential uh, red flags in connection with uh, migrant smuggling or human trafficking or other crimes. The point is also in a case that we are having some research done or have found some investigation on open researches or even if we have some intelligence, then we are also sharing this information with law enforcement agency or dedicated financial units. Um, I would say the back information um, in a case of a Germany, I think is not on a satisfied level now, but nevertheless, we are having a public private partnership. And I think in a case that we will be able to strengthen, strengthen somehow this international cooperation and to have a strong public private partnership that uh, would be definitely added value. And I always repeating, they do not need to give us uh, technical information that could uh, give us strategic one. And then if we have a good investigator analyze, we can always do the targeted investigation and we can have the final results and better results. Donna, and while you have the microphone, I think you've almost done it, but any final reflections from you on, on the discussion, on takeaways, on recommendations going forward? Yeah, I mean, for, from my end, I would say uh, that awareness, training and information sharing on national and international level is uh, very important because this crime is a heinous crime. It's something that's not happening, like I said, somewhere. It's happening here and now. The people should be trained in private sector on the first line and second line about this. The investigator should be aware of of risk indicators, and at the end, uh, the information should be provided to the regulated authority. Much, Dana. And just a quick one from the floor here. Pia Holm is clarifying just some information. Jersey is not on the grey list. So just to make that clear, in case we're offending anybody from uh, Jersey, uh, Salvador, please. Final thoughts from you. Well, one one quick comment just to add on with what what Melissa had mentioned about the migration flows. One thing that I, I believe is important is for the world community to go ahead and help some of these countries that are having their citizens depart, help them however it is that they need help in order to have them want to stay in their own home countries and prosper in their own home countries so that you don't have the best and brightest, say, leaving their own home countries to migrate to other places. Um, th that's just one thought. The, uh, my part parting comment here, it's all of our responsibility collectively, both from a private and private sector, public and private sector and law enforcement and otherwise, to help protect all of those that are the most vulnerable, uh, it, it, vulnerable persons that are involved in the migrant smuggling or trafficking organizations. Sadly, many individuals are part of our are, are quote unquote customers of migrant smugglers, but they may not be able to pay off their fee or pay their fee in time. And then they are then they are a trafficking victim. And sadly, I've, I've seen many of these cases where they are forced into the, the sexual industry. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. And thank you, Salvador, for joining us. Um, Lucia, any final comments, recommendations, thoughts, please? Yes. Well, firstly, I was going to issue a correction, but you beat me to it. Um, Jersey was on the EU grey list, um, which is around non-cooperation for, for taxation, not the FATF one, and was more recently taken off. Um, around the key messages, I mean, firstly, just to underscore the importance of what Melissa said around regular legal pathways, that is really um, the strongest approach to, to addressing migrant smuggling. Um, but, but also, I suppose, to highlight the limitations of the current response frameworks and the devastated consequences that these are having on the protection risks of those on the move and the opportunities that are presented by encouraging a greater proportion of financial flows to, to move into the form, formal financial um, systems in order to facilitate the type of tracking um, that Zana and Salvador have, have outlined and, and shown the real benefits of 
um, enabling tracking where the high degree of criminality is, um, but also seeking to safeguard the rights of those on the move. So um, really the, the potential within the current relatively limited space for response frameworks um, where you know, expanding legal migration options um, is not necessarily on the table everywhere. The, the financial flows are really a promising avenue um, that can start to track the highest criminal criminality without creating yet more protection risks for those on the move. Thank you. Thank you, Lejeune. It's been a pleasure to have you on this panel. And finally, from the panelists, Melissa, please. Well, I would just definitely reiterate the things that my fellow panelists have already already mentioned here. And of course, from my side, really focusing on the demand side of, you know, why people are using smugglers in the first place, I think is extremely important to really give uh, realistic alternatives to irregular migration. And maybe as a shameless plug in case, obviously, um, everyone should have a look at the um, FATF report here on this. If you're also interested just on more information on migration in general, I also have a YouTube channel that's meant for the broader public on a range of different migration issues, including trafficking, smuggling, um, irregular migration, but also a lot of other areas. So if you're interested in that, you can just type my name into YouTube and you will find that as a resource for the general public. But thank you so much. And thank you, Melissa, for joining us. Shameless plugs, always, yes. always welcome. Um, look, we're up, we're up against time. I'd like to encourage all of you, and that's 1,100 people who joined this, this uh, webinar, please do read and review the report. Please do look at its recommendations. I think there's some really important stuff uh, in there. I mean, the overarching conclusion here is the importance of working together against financial crime. That's the purpose. And, and I think we've seen the various dimensions of that. I'd like to close this meeting by thanking once again our excellent panelists. Thanks to the many hundreds of people, over a thousand who joined us. And of course, also thanks to the FATF Secretariat who have hosted this discussion and have been immensely professional in setting up this webinar. And it's been a pleasure to work with them and with all of you. From Geneva, I wish you a good afternoon. Thank you. From Lyon, France, thank you. <laughs>